Welcome to The Apartment Guys, where we dive deep into all things multifamily investing. Our mission is to educate, inspire, and empower real estate investors to reach their highest potential. Each week, host Tate Seamer interviews high-level guests from all over the industry who are sure to bring valuable, actionable ideas that will propel your career to the next level. Whether you're just starting out or a seasoned investor, you are in the right place. And now your host, the apartment guy, Tate Seamer. Welcome everybody back to another episode of the Apartment Guys podcast. And, you know, it's winter here in Salt Lake City. I am uh, just getting in from being out skiing and uh, I just uh, I'm, I'm joined today by Mr. Zane Jaffer, who is in San Francisco right now and one of my favorite places in the world, San Francisco. I just adore that city. And uh, so just to give you all a, a, an idea of where we're coming from today, um, I'm joined by by Zane, who is a self-described uh, serial entrepreneur, and I'm looking forward to uh, to hearing more about that and that self-description. But um, Zane sold his last startup for uh, $780 million to Blackstone in 2019, and he's currently a partner at Bluefield Capital, which is a, uh, a VC fund, a, a venture capital fund. Um, where he's buying real estate and uh, and other um, assets uh, that we'll talk about um, that have to do with uh, property technology. Zane's reach is, is over 110,000, and, and we're really, really stoked to have you here on the podcast, Zane. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for coming on the show from uh, foggy San Francisco. It didn't look foggy when you when you pointed the camera out there. It looked like it was kind of sunny. Is it foggy today? You know, it was this morning. It's getting better. It must be a good omen for our show. Okay. Okay. That's good. That's good. Well, cool. So y- you have done some amazing things in business, obviously, and, uh, and congratulations on all your success. That's super exciting. Um, tell us a little bit about kind of about Zane, where you're from originally and kind of how you cut your teeth in business and how you got to where you are today. So originally, as you might tell from my accent, I'm born in the UK, but my parents have a complicated history where we're from India. But my parents were actually born in Africa and they were booted from Africa uh, because of Idi Amin, this dictator mm-hmm. in uh, Uganda. So they fled to the UK, uh, grew up in a very poor environment. You know, as we're on a real estate show here, I always remember my parents stressing out about paying their part of the mortgage. They didn't Mm. own the full home, but thankfully there was a program where another company would put a down payment, own half the home and you'd pay rent to them. And the other half you'd get a mortgage for. And so constantly worried about our house getting possessed because we could never keep up with the payments. Mm -hmm. And I just was surprised, you know, growing up this concept of we live here. How come, I thought we own this home. My dad says we own this home and yet we have to pay these bills. And it turns out another company owns this home. So I was fortunate enough to discover the internet and was an addict when it came to spending my time playing computer games and also developing websites and coding. And I started building websites and companies. And after many, many failures, I started to figure out how to make money online and What transpired probably a decade later, I founded a company as mobile apps were taking off. And to use a real estate analogy, advertisers want to reach people and the real estate was your mobile phone, the screens. Mm -hmm. You figured Mm -hmm. out, well, you know, like having a billboard on a real estate building, if you can have an ad on a mobile phone and you can figure out how to do that, you control some very valuable real estate. Absolutely. And we grew that business and we, we, we launched it. We took a couple of million dollars in funding and took it to hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue, tens of millions, actually, you know, about 70, $80 million in profit every single year. Wow. And, uh, we sold that company. And throughout that period, when you're toiling away, building your startup, your entire net worth is concentrated in an illiquid asset. And you never know how you're going to do the magic trick of turning your paper shares into money in your account that's liquid. And 
I swore to myself, when I'm done with this company, I'm going to diversify so I can sleep at night. And real estate looks really interesting. When you study some of the most successful people, you'll see so many of them came from real estate. And if not, many have a big portfolio of real estate. Yeah. So that's what I did. When I, when I made my money, I set up a family office, which basically is a way to manage your money. And I started investing it across many different asset classes, everything from stocks and hedge funds to private equity, and then a big chunk of my net worth in real estate. And I started out trying to figure out how do I break into the industry? And if you've got a lot of capital, you get courted by so many people trying to raise money for their projects. So I you know, had the fortune of speaking to so many fund managers and learning from them firsthand. And you care about it because when you're putting your own hard-earned money into a project, you're going to do a lot more due diligence than reading or listening to you know, a course in school or wherever you get your knowledge from. Yeah. Having skin in the game is essential. So I started out by doing some hard money lending on some construction projects. Then I started investing in some funds, some of the big funds. I also did a lot of opportunity zone stuff, you know, with Bridge and Blackstone and others. And then I decided to invest directly in deals. So I'd have real estate companies come to me or developers come to me and say, you know, we've got this project in Arizona, we've got this project in Texas, and we are seeking LP capital. And I'd put in a lot of capital in some of these projects and I'd get special, you know, I'm Indian, I love discounts. So I'd always ask for a discount on the promote and carry or fees. And when you're putting in millions of dollars, you can get that. Sometimes you'll get a share of the GP as well. Right. And so I was doing that and I, I was just trying to figure out, okay, you know, how are these guys doing this? And I don't want to pay fees. I was really, really cheap. I didn't want to pay fees. I didn't want to pay carry. I wanted to go on the other side. And so as I'm learning from these other fund managers, I decide, you know, let me go and start operating and owning my own real estate portfolio. So I started buying single family rentals. Mm. And then I started buying multifamily buildings throughout Texas. I think 400 plus units uh, across five different buildings. Mm. And then the time passed. I just didn't understand. How is it that I'm making money but the funds I've invested in, I'm making even more money. And that's after I paid them a fee, after I paid them a carry and a promote. And that's when I realized, you know, uh, doing this alone is hard. And so I'm, I think I should join up with one of these funds and, and you know, put money in and learn. And so that's what I did. I, 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 uh, I found Bluefield Capital and Bluefield Capital is a private equity fund. There are billions of dollars of real estate, a lot of multifamily, but also industrial warehouses, hospitality assets, senior care facilities, doing a lot of ground up construction now as well, and even moving into single family rentals, a lot of things. And so I joined them, my partner there, put a lot of my money there now, and um, the results have been fantastic. And alongside that, I've started a venture capital fund because this industry just seems to be, for, for a tech guy, it's archaic. Everyone runs everything on spreadsheets. Mm-hmm. And I felt, well, you know, if we bring in technology, if given that everything is valued on this one key metric, NOI, if you improve your revenues and you decrease your cost, you produce NOI, net operating right. income. Well, bring in technology, have a hungry founder try to make you improve your profits and your building's worth so much more, a mm-hmm. multiple of your NOI usually. Mm-hmm. So yeah, that's what I'm doing now. I'm investing in startups and buying real estate and I love it. Wow. Yeah, that's amazing. So you, I mean, the well, first of all, as I'm sitting there, like listening to you and taking all that in the first thing that I think of like throughout is like diversification. Like you just th- throughout your entire, well, obviously during your startup, it was the exact opposite, right? Like that was the problem was that you had nothing liquid. It was nothing was diversified at all, but then you were able to access the equity and that, and the wealth in that company. And uh, and, and then you were able to really diversify. I mean, you started you, you started your your family office. You did hard money loans. Um, you invested in funds, opportunity zones, single family rentals, multifamily. Uh, I mean, you have definitely taken advantage of a lot of different lanes in in, in this space. And uh, the one thing that seems, uh, I guess, ubiquitous or across, you know, kind of across your portfolios, you seem to stick mostly residential. Is that the case? 
or yes, yes, yeah. it's, it's the bread and butter. It's the easiest to understand, and it's easy to replace the uh, management if things aren't working well. And yeah. and there's a big market of buyers. Uh, it's the easiest thing to understand. We need shelter, and um, people pay their rent. And it, it, it's it's eventually a real estate. When I first came into this, it was very difficult to understand how do you how do you operate in value. Eventually, when you see enough deals, it, you develop like a sixth sense. Mm-hmm. After you study a market for a long time, and uh, I find multifamily is much easier to evaluate than other specialist asset classes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you got to kind of go with what you become an expert in too. And you've obviously developed a tremendous amount of expertise in, uh, in the residential and the multifamily space. And so you kind of glossed it over, but you said billions in, in assets. Um, do you have a, a, a unit count, so to speak? Everybody is, uh, that's such a sexy thing, right? The, the I whole think it's thing. probably um, around 10,000 units across everything. So multifamily hospitality, we're there, it's called keys or doors. Yeah, yeah. You know, it might be beds or however we want to describe it. Mm-hmm. Um, pr- probably around 10,000-ish is, is, my, is my guess. And then on the industrial side, we, we have uh, a lot of land that we're developing um, and we're, we're talking 10 million square feet plus of industrial space as well. Oh, wow. So okay. Big. Okay. Yeah. So you are, you are getting into d- developing in the industrial, was that like flex industrial, like smaller warehouse we, or we, so we, we had smaller warehouses to start with, and this is prior to me joining Bluefoot Capital. Um, and we sold off a lot of our industrial assets to focus on a few larger projects, ground up construction. Timing mm-hmm. was perfect again before my time, but around 2017 started building uh, and pre-leasing. And, you know, we, we had options to buy a lot of land. We're talking hundreds, maybe thousands of acres and um, just building them in phases. And the uh, key tenants now are some of the large e-commerce companies um, and everything's been a boon with COVID, especially mm-hmm. the supply chain sector is, is working out really well for those that own industrial cap rates are compressing and people are pre-leasing space before it's built and they're paying you know, what was, if you came in at the right time, insane rents and multiples where you're getting your 10 year pro forma in year one, <laughs> you know, your IRRs are extremely high. You don't get those deals anymore. The secret's out, mm-hmm. but you know, it's, it's working out really well. Yeah. That's excellent. That's excellent. Well, so you know, this is the apartment guys podcast. And so we're obviously our, our bread and butter here and the listener base uh, is, is highly interested in successful multifamily transactions and, and acquisitions and ownership. And, and you've obviously had plenty of success in that realm. What would you say, you know, given the, given the amount of volume you guys have done and, and, you know, you kind of, I'm sure seen it all at this point, right. I'm, I, I know it hasn't been smooth sailing the whole way. I'm sure you've, you've had adversity and challenges along the way, but you know, what have you learned so far in, in, in this world? I don't want to sound arrogant. There's on a podcast. I guess I can be a bit controversial here. Sure. Half the people don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Real estate, which is why sometimes it's quite easy to make money, but you also have to appreciate when you're new to the industry, you're definitely going to be in the 50% that doesn't know what they're doing and you're going to get taken advantage of. Um, You're going to lose money on your first few deals and it's very disheartening. It's very frustrating. So it's important, especially if you have a lot of capital to play with. And in my case, you know, I I went in heavy, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I sort of wish I'd gone in slower buying, you know, one rental at a time rather than one building at a time, right? Because there was urgent pressure for me to put my money to work because interest rates um, are low and you know I was just sitting on a lot of cash and I wanted to put it to work uh, and real estate seemed like such a good area to move into especially with worries about impending inflation so going in slow when you start is key and realizing that you're probably going to make some mistakes and that's mm-hmm. part of the game mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. mistakes you make ideally will be something you'll learn from and the successes you have will completely dwarf the mistakes. And some typical mistakes I've made, uh, I would say, I'll, I'll give you two mistakes I've made. 
One mistake is that I came from the tech industry and I invest heavily in startups. I love startups. And when you're investing in startups, you're really betting on the person. You don't look at numbers. Numbers are sort of irrelevant beyond market size. Your pro forma and what you think you're going to do in year two, three, four, out the door, I don't care. Like, right, right. Just grow your business. And you can get charmed by the charisma of the founder you're talking to. And you know, you're betting on that person. Like, can they recruit people? Are, are, are they visionary? You do not want to take that same approach when you're buying real estate. Mm -hmm. You don't want to be buying the charisma of the agent or the seller because you're going to be taken advantage of. So it was a mindset shift. In, in, in this world, it's more about the numbers and the spreadsheets and whatever they give you, throw it out the window and re, you know, create your own model because they are the, the, the assumptions that some of these spreadsheets come with um, are, are just outrageous, honestly, outrageous, you know? Um, and you've got to dive in and be very specific and look at comps. So I think there was a sort of a laziness on my part when I started out to do all that work. Um, mm -hmm. Instead, trusting the agent, trusting the seller with what should I do with the asset? Questions like that, you, you know, I, I know you want to learn, but don't ask those questions to the, um, to, to, to the sell side. Um, so, you know, that's where it's important to have a community of others who are with you and have partners that you can buy with. So that was one mistake I made. I was a little bit too optimistic and, and ambitious, and I had a different frame of reference. And um, I forget the other one now, but, you know. <laughs> it'll, it'll come to you. Well, no, that's, I, there's, that's why, you know. <laughs> what, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, it, and like, there's some great, gems right just right there is some great takeaways like everything in this world seems to come back to the importance of having good people around you like you just can't state how important that is and you know the whole i think it's uh i think it was the ford quote you are the average of the five the five yeah. people that you spend the most time with or the you know the five closest people that you have to you you know, whether or not that's technically true, I think there's a lot of truth in that statement and, and who you surround yourself with really puts you at the level that where they are, I, you know, for better, or for worse. And you're going to, if you're surrounded by good people and in a mastermind or a, a good advisor situation, they're not going to let you make mistakes that like Zane and Tate have made, <laughs> for instance. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that's why I decided to join a private equity fund and put my money to work with them, be a GP. And oh my God, the way they do things is so different than the way I do things as a first timer. You know, when I came into real estate, you made all those typical amateur mistakes. And when you're with seasoned people, um, you really see that. And mm -hmm. patience is such a virtue and it's very easy to get swept into winning a deal. And I yeah. feel like people are losing their patience in this environment today. Mm -hmm. Luke, what I really like is they're very conservative, very much focused on, you know, let's, let's underwrite conservatively. And that's not happening today. Too yeah. much new money is coming in. That was an example of some of the new money coming in that was, you know, um, being aggressive with buying. And look, I got lucky, actually. A lot of what I bought is appreciated, but I got lucky. It wasn't skill. It was luck. Right. Mm -hmm. And there were mistakes I made, but I could have made far more if I had just teamed up with the right people and people that compliment you, which doesn't mean um, have the same skills as you. It's important to have people that are the, in some ways, the opposite of you as well. That's around. right. Yeah. Yeah. Especially if you're like a visionary and uh, somebody that like, is kind of naturally wired to be an optimist and that sort of thing. Like having a realist in the camp and in the corner is that, that can go a, an awful long way. By the way, I just want to point out you're very authentic Zane, and you're also very humble. And I appreciate that very much in a person and in you um, you've been very, very successful. And to say that you were lucky is probably oversimplifying things a little bit, I, I'm sure, because uh, I know there's more to, to that level of success than just luck. But I also get what you're saying in that if you have been investing in real estate in the last, especially even three years, but five years, seven years, you have 
you know, a lot of sins have been covered up by appreciation. <laughs> right. And, you know, it, whether you're flipping single family houses or or um, apartment buildings or doing, you know, three, five year models on apartments, uh, multifamily, that sort of thing. The growth cycle that we've been in, which has been amazingly long now and is, you know, everybody kind of agrees we're we're due for some sort of change, whether that's a correction or a whatever you want to crash or whatever it looks like. But if you've been doing it the last few years, things have gone well. Let's just put it that way. And, and that's, General. that's, pretty, it's very dangerous because if you haven't gone through multiple cycles, mm -hmm. you sort of speak on behalf of the team, right? Because they, they have and they've been in real estate forever. Once you've gone through multiple cycles, you, you realize, okay, things feel frothy. And um, well, what I've noticed at Bluefield is that a lot of the people buying some of our real estate and a lot of the people that are outbidding us are new. There's people that we respect and admire who have also made a lot of money in real estate aren't the ones who are writing the, who are winning the projects right now. It mm -hmm. feels a bit like what's happened with tech stocks where you've got a lot of new money coming in and people just keep holding on for dear life and leveraging up and being very aggressive with their assumptions. And then the market can really turn on you. And look, I, I got hurt too in the tech industry recently because I have a lot of tech stocks, right? But ultimately, I'm diversified. I've got you know a lot of value, um, a lot of value and dividend types of stocks too. And the way I manage my portfolio is really interesting when it comes to real estate. Maybe we can talk about that later because you know if you're in real estate, you also want to diversify, but you want what you do to support your real estate. But mm -hmm. going back to what I'm seeing right now. We have lost so many deals and we, we've bought quite a few deals. Okay. Um, we've, we've got a fund that we set up uh, as COVID hit. I realized I feel like there's going to be blood on the streets. I was wrong by the way, but I thought this is going to be like 08, 09 and we're going to be getting so many good deals. Never happened. We, we, you know, there was probably a window of opportunity. I would say for six to 12 months max, and if you had a deal on the contract, you probably had a bit of leverage as for a short time, banks weren't lending. So mm -hmm. if you could make all cash transactions, and I did make all cash transactions, um, you could get a discount. You could say, well, you know, I'm kind of freaked out with what's going on. Um, and we were planning to refinance this property as soon as we bought it. So I want, I want a haircut. And so, you know, we, we made money there. Um, hospitality, we thought would be destroyed. And some sectors have been hit, but the government funding has been just unbelievable. And a lot of multifamily folks realized, hey, let's buy that hotel and turn it into multifamily. And so all hotels now are being priced as multifamily conversions. Right. Um, <laughs> so, so what happened? I mean, we, 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 bought, we bought a handful of assets, probably five or six assets, you know, um, probably 50 to $100 million in equity we deployed. I wish we had deployed more, honestly, wish we had. Mm. Uh, but it would have been wrong because we would have had to change our assumptions. Um, we could have bought so much more. And the people that bought more, I've sat down with them and I've asked, how, how did you outbid us? Real estate is kind of a cliquey industry. Mm -hmm. It's pretty cool. You know, you can sit down with other buyers uh, or, you know, people you lost out on a deal. Uh, and what I've heard has horrified me. Well, you know, after we lost so many deals, we were under pressure to deploy from our LPs. And we had to make a few assumptions with our model. Yeah, okay, what type of assumptions? You, you, you know what I hear? I hear, this is what I hear. Well, you know, we assume the rent growth is going to continue at these rates. Target we rents, assume, yeah. We assume that cap rates are going to compress. Mm. Not expand, but compress, mm. right? And we assume interest rates are going to stay low forever. Now, um, you, we've been, those people who have done that have been extraordinarily lucky in this environment. But as interest rates go up, if rent growth doesn't keep up, <laughs> if cap rates expand, your model or, or even your LTV ratio, you know, the, the amount of loan you have could kill you completely. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened before, you know, in 09 and other, in other, in other cycles. Mm -hmm. And these people are going to be very vulnerable. But, you know, where I see now, I'm tired of calling the top. Real estate just keeps on going up. I feel like we're due for a correction, but it ain't happening. And yeah. we just have to keep buying and be conservative with when we bid and work harder to find deals that pencil out, which often means off-market deals and being a bit more of a specialist 
and doing things that are uncomfortable, like mm -hmm. leaving the leaving primary core markets because too much money is coming in and going to tertiary markets mm -hmm. and being like the king in that market, you know, building yeah. a reputation in that market. Yeah. 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 We're, we're, we own in tertiary markets uh, in central Ohio and we're believers in that as well. Yeah, I mean, Ohio is great. yeah, it's, we're just an hour, about an hour North of Columbus and, um and i don't have you did you hear about the uh the new intel semiconductor uh absolutely and we we just um we just bought a we're, well we, we've got the ps and everything done so i guess i can talk about it but we just bought a hotel in dayton ohio oh beautiful you know? nice and, and these are the types of places we're having to look at to get the irs that we want but yeah. it's not all I, I don't believe like if you just focus on and the, by the way, now I, I remember the second mistake that I made, right? Um, and this mistake is one that a lot of amateurs make, and I made too. You get focused on some KPIs and metrics too much. Mm -hmm. It could be the cap rate you're buying at, which is nonsense because you've got to dive into what that metric means. Or in my case, the value, and this, this really happened to me in single family, by the way. I would be obsessed with trying to get the lowest price per square foot. My thoughts was, well, it's just a building and I, you know, I, I want the lowest price per square foot and I'm, I'm, you know, I want to bid so I get that. You end up ignoring things like the vintage of the building, which is one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. You end up ignoring the intangibles. In, in, in single family, there's a lot of intangibles. In multifamily, you're buying a business. So it doesn't really matter about you know how how beautiful the the interior is like it was a big learning curve for me understanding that the way you buy single family for consumers to you know buy it from you or rent it from you is very different than multifamily where you're buying a business but you've got to be ruthless in multifamily and, and it's not about how beautiful the countertops are it really is get your costs as low as you can so i think that that was a mistake i made uh, which is mistake number two Focusing too much on some metrics and, and being blind to other things and location and t location is key. Um, and I, I kind of wish I'd spent more because I would have benefited more from appreciation rather than being valued on cap rates because I own some product in many tertiary markets that have gone up, but not as much as Austin has, not as much as the hot markets have. And I turned down deals because I couldn't fathom. Why would I spend hundreds of thousands per unit in a tier one market when I could buy something for 50K a door? 50k right. a door is like wow yeah. but you don't realize you may have to put like another 30k per door in just to kind of make everything pencil out and do you want to do that no you probably don't yeah yeah so you mentioned earlier that you do or you were doing all cash deals was that just during covid or is that a general model for you it, it was a model for me before um and my thoughts were and i i this part didn't work for me. Uh, I wanted to find some quick value add opportunities where I'd come in, buy it all cash. So I would have an advantage against other buyers. Mm -hmm. And then I would improve the property immediately because there was something very wrong with it. Obviously, maybe it was poorly managed. Maybe it needed some renovation. Maybe you need to turn it from a class C to a class B, right? Do that and then refinance out and ideally get most of your, um, the initial cash you put in back out. Mm -hmm. I came up with this beautiful theoretical model that doesn't work. And I invested in people that had the same model and it didn't work for them either. You cannot get rich quick. It doesn't work. But I came up with a model and this is how I sort of manage my family office assets. I went very heavy into um, uh, a, a lot of um, securities like bonds and stocks that are very safe. And I got very lucky because, you know, I came in when the market was low and it's gone up very high, but I borrowed against those assets to buy cash flowing properties. So as an example, if you have stocks, you can borrow 60 to 75% against it. If you have bonds, you can sometimes borrow 90% against it. So let's just, uh, I'll choose a number, let's say $100 million in, in stocks and bonds, right? Mm -hmm. From that, you can probably tap into about $70 million out. And you're, you're paying, if you have a lot of capital, you're paying sometimes sub 1% interest rates. So you, uh -huh. you, you take that $70 million and you go out and you start buying real estate, that cash flow immediately. Mm -hmm. You improve it. You get a refund, you get that $70 million back and you still own the equity. That was the model. It didn't quite work like that. Okay. I ended up tying a little bit too much cash and some of these things were not as quick to refinance as you hoped. And sometimes you realized why refinance this? Maybe I should just sell it. Or maybe 
I now need to start thinking about my overall portfolio. And I'm now seeing real estate as an alternative to bonds. Who wants mm-hmm. bonds and fixed interest rates at like 2% or 1%? I'd much rather own real estate that has the chance to appreciate and get me 4 or 5%. It makes me cringe to say that 4 or 5%. That cash on cash would be unacceptable five, six years ago. But today, yeah. Like, you know, if you're borrowing 1% and you're getting 5%, great. Um, mm. So yeah, that's sort of, sort of an insight into the idea I had. It didn't quite work in, you know, as, as I wanted though. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's obviously, it sounded really powerful as a model. So at, at that point you had a lot of cash to deploy. So was it kind of more out of convenience that like in not dealing with, with banks and lenders yes. and all that? No, that, that's that's actually right because I had no credibility, right? I, I hadn't really had a track record of buying real estate. And okay. you know, once you buy enough single family assets, suddenly you you can't take a personal mortgage out on that because right. you know, once you're at four plus or what well, depends what state you're in too, there are limits and types of loans you can tap into. And then I thought single family is getting annoying. I did not realize buying a million dollar condo in San Francisco comes with so much paperwork. Or, you know, mm-hmm. or a $2 million home and renting that out comes with so much paperwork. And I was like, I'd rather go and buy a $10 million building and, and you know, you're getting more leverage mm-hmm. and you don't have the headaches of, of, of um, different interiors. It's schizophrenic, you know, when you have, mm-hmm. 10, you have 10 different single family buildings and, and the interiors are different and they're spread out across a city and your maintenance staff now can't service that. So I'd rather have one building and make that really efficient and make that work well. There you go. That's there's an audio clip right there for my producers. They can take that last 30 seconds, 60 seconds and clip that one out. That's a good one. Um, well said. Um, all right. So let's talk, uh, let's talk tech for, for a second and where you see things headed with property technology in particular. I mean, we were talking before we started recording Zane, uh, about, I guess, actually, you said it earlier in the podcast, how everything is pretty much based on spreadsheets. And that's really true. Uh, my, my buddy, David Tupin is doing some cool things with, uh, with in his, in the acquisition world with, uh, with his, his technology, uh, company called real estate lab, just a little shout out to him. He's a buddy of mine, but I'm real curious as to, as to, you know, where you see things headed in the the property technology world and we'll talk just about apartments because my god real estate's huge and there's so much opportunity in so many asset classes and we've our vc fund has made so many investments uh i think we're approaching 15 now and you know we're going to continue to invest and probably get to 20 25 ish uh i've been focusing a lot on apartments actually because it's easy for me to do due diligence on a startup claiming to help so the idea is this in real estate we all buy apartments because we see an arbitrage somewhere information asymmetry we feel it's being mismanaged we feel we can usually bump up the rents we can cut costs we can we can add value in some way right and maybe it's maybe it's amenities which indirectly means you have more retention, more renewals and higher rents. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a way, a system to uh, improve your delinquency so people pay rent on time. All of these things technology can help with, okay? And the way way real estate's run today is very archaic. There is this attitude and I appreciate the attitude and it's don't fix it if it ain't broken. Of course, in real estate, things have worked so well that even a monkey can make money. Frankly, you, you, you know, you buy a bunch of assets anywhere, anywhere in the U.S. and it appreciates and, you know, you're getting crazy cash on cash returns after, you know, rents have gone up or you're getting great IRS for investors. Dangerous, by the way, because every fund has a great track record, right? So <laughs> you know, look at why, why is that? Some of it's luck. Um, so you've got, to, you've got to be smarter than everyone else. And... To squeeze more NOI out of a building, you've got to bring in technology. And to operate better as an investor, you've got to use technology as well. So when we break that down, if you improve your revenue and you decrease cost, you have more NOI. As buildings usually trade on a cap rate, an NOI increase can have a tremendous um, you know, impact on your uh, valuation for the building, right? Yep, yep. So here's where you can bring in technology. Number one, in how you analyze and underwrite investments. 
It could be deal flow, it could be the underwriting. Another way you can implement technology is in the management and operations of the real estate itself. So property management firms typically uh, charge a you know, percentage fee of rents or perhaps a fixed amount per door. And they're not always incentivized to improve your profit. They'll spend money, they'll have their preferred vendors and you have technology, you can have more transparency, you can hold them account, you can hold them accountable. And you can also cut some obvious costs, especially if you're in the property management industry. Do you really have to uh, have a physical person show each unit? Virtual tours or audio tours are so much more effective. Mm -hmm. In some cases, you don't even need a huge leasing office anymore. You could outsource that to a call center unless the state requires you to. You could do a lot more. Um, you could you, you could build a library of all the appliances in your apartment, for example. And when there's a maintenance issue, a lot of things are easily solved. Well, it would be great if you had a chat bot. It would be great if your mobile phone, uh, you know, you, you, you hover over like the appliance and it gives you a walkthrough. Okay, which issue are you facing right now? You can cut down your maintenance significantly. Yeah. Uh, and then there's ways of automating rent collection, which so many people still don't do. So many people still pay rent by, you know, knocking on the door and collecting it or through money orders or whatever. Um, there's one really cool startup that we invested in, stake.rent, where rather than giving concessions, so this is, this is one way we've made money, right? Rather than giving concessions, and the concession for the audience basically means uh, one month rent free. Mm -hmm. It's so common. You give one month rent free, we don't see that as real estate investors as a cost, but it is a cost. Huge fact, cost. Yeah. Banks always ask for this, you know, what about yeah. concessions? What about this? Um, your amateur investor doesn't see it as a cost, but it is a cost. And it's, it's like roughly 8.3% of your annual revenue that you're wow. giving up. So why, why do that? And your tenant doesn't appreciate that. One month free, even two months free, I've seen. In a SEF, my God, it was like three months free plus lower rent. So what, what Stake does is it's don't offer concessions. Pay Stake instead, and they'll give cash back to the renters when they sign the lease and when they pay their rent on time. Mm -hmm. What Stake's also doing, Stake, like S-T-A-K-E, mm -hmm. right, what they also do is now they've launched a debit card for renters. And so when renters use this debit card, they get cash back, like 5% cash back until March. And what that does for the owner is you, you get a financial health into your community and you can see how they're spending their money and it's a signal and it's way more effective than the rent roll. You know, if, if, if you know, people are spending money on luxury goods, that's one thing. If they're going to the gas station a lot and, you know, they're, they're, they're even redeeming cash out of the app, rather than keeping in, in the app to earn high interest, that tells you, you may have a delinquency risk here. So, you know, that's just one case study, but you can use technology in so many ways to mm -hmm. improve this. I've also seen things on the hardware side and hardware is interesting. Um, I'm looking at a company right now where in Europe and Israel and other countries, they um, meter water, so not electricity. And I, I know in our industry in real estate, you can maybe submeter the electricity usage. Other times you provide utilities and gas, but water isn't typically something that you will charge the tenant for. You'll just cover that centrally. And the theory is that if tenants are having to pay for their own water usage, they're going to be more accountable. And if you can add a little piece of hardware at the appliance level, like your washing machine or your um, fridge or you know sink or toilet not only can you detect potential leakage but you can bill the tenant for water usage and net net it's much cheaper and your noi will increase mm -hmm. by just having accountability another model i've seen is uh and i think your listeners will love this because a lot of people it's an obvious idea but people don't do this um creating like a subscription as a service revenue stream for amenities like the gym room or laundry facilities so you know, one of the easiest value add opportunities is to have a, a laundry hookup um, in your apartment, you know, like put a washer or dryer there. But if that isn't available, then you have a central laundry facility that's coin operated. Well, why do that? Why not just charge a monthly membership fee to each tenant so they can access that? And that's a whole new revenue stream. Now, to administer that requires some technology. So that's where prop technology comes in, mm -hmm. where 
companies, companies that are figuring out ways to boost your ROI. I mean, I can talk about this all day long because I've seen 500 plus startups just targeting the multifamily space. Mm. And they're dying for customers and they have to prove to the customer that I can improve your ROI. For your listeners, that's music to their ears because mm-hmm. I'm a hungry startup founder, figure out how to improve your ROI for you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I mean, like what you said, water conservation there is huge. And like we're in the, we, as you mentioned earlier, we're in the Ohio market and water in Ohio is not cheap at all. And, uh, nor, nor really should it be. It's, it's a, you know, it's a precious commodity. It's, you know, living out here in the West, especially we know that. So, um, you know, that said, like, it, anything that you can do, whether it's it, it you you talked almost about a, it, it sounded like sub metering uh, in in a way each uh, each point of usage in uh, in a water uh, in, in in water usage in an apartment uh, that sounds pretty amazing um, and you know that right there is like you said a total NOI game changer I mean. Uh, I think our water bill on our 180 unit uh, building is probably in the uh, $65,000, $70,000 range, something like that in Ohio. So like that's significant. I mean, at a uh, if you're able to recapture, let's just say you're able to recapture all of that through a utility bill back at a, let's say at a six cap, that's uh, 1.1 million in value right there that you've created. So listeners, if you, if you like to know more about that, there's lots of good resources out there on, on cap rate valuation and how you, how you evaluate commercial real estate and multifamily real estate through using the income formula. Um, and it's pretty, it's pretty important that you understand it. It's pretty basic. Once you understand it, you'll be, it'll make a lot of sense to you. Um, but, the the take home is that if you can move the needle on your NOI, you're exponentially moving the needle on your value. And that's what Zane's talking about is figuring out ways through automation, which is look, everything these days is is being affected by that. And you know, pretty soon we'll be talking about artificial intelligence and you know implementing that into our systems and processes and, and uh, everything's going this way. And you're right. There's a, it is pretty archaic in the, the, the property management world in general, uh, what, from what we've found um, and, you know, lots of room for growth. That's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. E- even on that note, one company we invested in popular homes they figured out a model where because we operate a tech enabled property management firm, we operate at super high margins Mm. and we have a very high valuation multiple because we're a tech company. They're now going out and they've raised a lot of money and they're about to raise even more. And they're going out and buying traditional property management firms. A lot of property management firms struggle to scale and many are mom and pop run. And they get to a point where they're going to have to take on fixed cost and they don't want to. So they keep the number of units they manage kind of small. And most property management people, a lot of them hate their job and yeah. you know, they want to tap out. And Poplar is going out there buying these buying property management firms at a, on a traditional valuation multiple, which can be like one or two X. And their gross margins are sometimes as low as 7%, you know, up to like 30%, I've heard. Maybe 40% if they're amazing. Poplar is like a 60, 70% gross margin sometimes. So there's, a, there's, there's consolidation happening and you're going to see some like very powerful tech enabled firms coming out there. Mm-hmm. There's nothing mainstream. It's still like Graystar and others who have a lot of technology and Graystar, I just give as an example, they're like the number one, you know, multifamily apartment property manager. And it's such a cachet to have them manage your building and your lenders always appreciate that because who your property manager is does impact your your you know situation. Uh, yeah. But all of these companies are going to be disrupted if they don't embrace technology aggressively enough. And, and Graystar does; they have a lot of internal technology. But the other, you know, the rest of the top ten lagging behind. And technology is always a, an investment, a cost, and um, it's very hard to embrace it when 
you know, you're flooded. Your typical property manager is coming with you sometimes to underwrite deals before you buy them. They're dealing with fires everywhere throughout the portfolio. When do they have the chance to think strategically? Very rarely. You know, and if they have technology, it's a mismatch of like technology. It's not integrated. So Poplar is sort of focused on being like a very focused, integrated technology uh, based property management firm. And that's just one example. There's examples of this throughout the entire value chain of, of real estate. So if listeners want to learn more about, first of all, stake.rent, right, is the resource you were talking about before, S-T-A-K-E dot rent. Um, if listeners want to learn more about, uh, you know, what you think are interesting opportunities and and especially in the property management world, uh, where would they find out more? Yeah. Um, so bluefieldcap.com is our website and you can see some of our investments on there. Uh, poplarhomes.com was another one I mentioned. Mm-hmm. A really cool one. And I'm, if you don't mind, I'll give a shout out here because this is an interesting model. Um, there's a startup we invested in run by a 3X female founder. So basically she sold three companies in the past called Roost. Join Roost. Okay. Mm-hmm. okay. Uh, what they do, I found really intriguing. Um, they take out the hassle of managing security deposits. It's always so much administration involved in that for a property manager or owner. And what they do is they allow the renter to borrow against their security deposit. Hmm. And currently your average renter has a net worth of what? $6,300. It's hmm. very sad because when there's an emergency, they can't tap into liquidity and there's predatory payday loans out there that have multi hundred percent APRs and you have other products that are emerging in the technology sector, like renter insurance, with the strings attached. What Roost does is they'll manage the security deposit. And then if a renter wants to tap into it and borrow like 60% or whatever it might be based on the score, they can. So I know Roost is looking for multifamily operators to sort of trial, trial with. And if there's any you know folks on your podcast who want to kind of connect, um, ping me and I'll introduce you. Um, to any of our companies in our portfolio. And I'm sure many can, you know, tangibly improve the value of the real estate that people own by using tech. That's, that's a generous offer. What's the best way for people to reach you, Zane? Zane at bluefieldcap.com or Zane at proptechvc.com. Proptechvc.com is a sort of a website I've built that has my own forks. I have a podcast on there about prop tech and, building a directory so you can see who all the players are in the prop tech industry. So yeah, that's uh, that's one way to reach me. And Zane for the listeners that aren't, uh, aren't watching is Z a I N. So, so Zane at bluefieldcap.com is, is uh, Zane's email address. So a uh, couple other things I want to, I want to ask you about before uh, we let you go, we're coming up, unfortunately, uh, to the top of the hour here, but um, man, I, I almost hate to bring it up, but I, you're, you're a very, very smart guy. And I can tell that you watch trends carefully and, and uh, kind of have your finger on the pulse of a lot of things. So what's your take on crypto right now? Wow. Um, crypto is a future. I think, it's going to really cut out an entire industry of middlemen, especially in the real estate sector. If you look at the real estate sector, you have title companies, escrow agents, you have banks, you have, you have real estate agents even, and, and, and it's very difficult to tap into liquidity. And I think crypto, specifically the blockchain, will offer opportunity for buyers and sellers to fractionalize their real estate, like selling a corner of your building, you know, mm-hmm. to anyone without paying these crazy fees to the middlemen. And these transactions can happen in milliseconds and are verified on the blockchain. So there's trust and security in place. So I think um, blockchain is going to have a big impact. Um, I think you hate to bring up crypto because at the time of this podcast, crypto has gone down. Right. If you crypto early, the, what, what, there is no down. <laughs> like people, some people got in like, you know, the thousands of dollars, right? right. Um, so I, th- I think crypto has a lot of promise. Uh, but I'm interested in the use cases for property technology and blockchain. I still mm-hmm. think we're far away though from mainstream adoption. There are right now I'm seeing buildings in New York, you know, there was one listed for $29 million where the owner would only take crypto, like Bitcoin. Mm-hmm. I, I see things like that. It's not pure like blockchain, some of its publicity stunt. Mm-hmm. So, uh, just trying to tap into the to the very rich people who have Bitcoin who will jump on everything that has crypto in it, you know? Right. Um, 
The other thing about crypto, a lot of crypto people are investing in real estate. And a lot yeah. of crypto people are great people to go after to become LPs or yeah. factors of your real estate project. And I call it the barbell strategy, right? In that on one end of the extreme, you've got crypto. And on the other hand, you've got real estate that produces cash flow. And real estate helps crypto people sleep better at night, you know? Um, so that's my, that's my quick thoughts. Okay. I, I love it. Yeah. That's uh that's good stuff. And yeah, for, for listeners, this is uh, this basically end of January, 2022 and, and crypto has taken a big hit in the last 10 days or so. And so um, I don't know people, a lot of, a lot of people aren't sure which way is up and which way is down and everything else. But um, so, uh, and then I guess one just totally shifting gears, what are your thoughts on the Airbnb model for, uh, it, cause that's, that's a model that seems to come up a lot with, with my listener base. And, and even I am tempted by, uh, the, the Airbnb model, um, which is saying a lot cause it takes a lot to tempt me away from multifamily. But, um, is that something you guys are, you know, you've done everything else. Is that something you've, you've done? Nightly not, rental? not enough. Um, but yes, I have the nightly rentals, but I've done it through a, uh, a property management company that doesn't use Airbnb. They do corporate furnished short-term rentals. So I have a few units that are corporate short-term furnished rentals. I think Airbnb is a fantastic model. Uh, I think it needs to be implemented more in multifamily. The problem is a lot of banks don't like it. And a lot of buyers don't like it either. And they don't know how to value it. So I have, I have some buildings... Um, well, one of the buildings in Texas uh, can benefit from a, a lot of transient uh, workers. So by that, I mean um, military. You've got working nurses who will you know, come in uh, to a city because of COVID and, or you've got construction workers. These folks don't want to sign the 12 year, sorry, 12 month lease or even a six month lease. But if they can take it, you know, a nightly rate, they'll do that. Mm -hmm. And so, Often, um, the headache of implementing this for me has been convincing the property managers to do it. I use third party property managers mm -hmm. and it, it's sort of like, it, it, the, the, there is some administration required and you have to do it well. And, you know, there's an arbitrage. You want to know the arbitrage right now for your listeners. Okay. If you go out and you try to build an Airbnb platform from scratch, as in you go, you go and try to buy, you know, rentals and put them on Airbnb. Do you know what the going rates are to pay for commission for Airbnb? They're, they're like crazy high, man. Like yeah, yeah. You know, 20, 30%, sometimes maybe even higher. Mm -hmm. Do you want to pay that much as a fee? No. So here's the arbitrage, okay? I, most of the time, what I've seen, multifamily property managers who charge anywhere from 2% to maybe 5% will also do the same for Airbnbs. If you tell them I want five, I've got a hundred units and I want to experiment putting these on Airbnbs. I've been surprised. I've, I've, we have this in our Bluefoot portfolio. We have a couple of units, oh sorry, a couple of buildings where we have a portion of those where we're putting them on Airbnb mm -hmm. and we're only paying five percent uh, commission mm -hmm. to the property manager, which is their average rate. What yeah. an arbitrary! So that's if you own one of family, you can enter it with like some muscle there, you know? Mm -hmm. But if you want to try to find a generic Airbnb property manager, you're going to pay a lot more and they do offer a lot of value. They usually have an account with great reviews and, you know, ratings and they're really catered to the every need the, the, the you know, uh, tenant has. Airbnb yeah. gets different sometimes, but man, I, I definitely want to save money on the commission. I can't justify 30%. I, yeah. I, I it's huge. Yeah. It's huge for sure. Yeah. You got to have a very profitable property to make that make sense. So, well, Zane, this has been amazing. Um, and I, there's a lot of other things. I've got notes and questions in front of me here. Um, but we're, unfortunately we're, we're out of time. Um, so we'll have to do this again and maybe in the next, uh, six, 12 months or so and, and, uh, and cover some of the other things that you're an expert in. So, um, really appreciate your time today. Is there, are, are there any, Final thoughts you have uh, for the listeners as we as we cut loose. You know, keep listening to the podcast. It's great you're bringing on you know folks to share experience, and you're going to make mistakes when you get started. So that's one takeaway. Mm -hmm. uh, the other takeaway is don't get focused on the metrics alone. You've got to look at the bigger picture and don't try to you know get the cheapest price you can. 
bring in technology when you can to save money and don't try to time the market. Just, just start investing. Um, you're going to do a lot. You're going to do a lot better than just reading. You, you've got to put some money at work and try to find other partners who are also uh, complement your weaknesses. Beautiful summary there. There is a lot of really good stuff there, guys. And if you go back through the show and take notes, you'll, you'll find a lot of common themes there. So Zane, thanks a ton, man. This was fantastic. Really appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. You betcha. So listeners, thank you for listening to another episode of the apartment guys, and we will catch you on the next one. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening to The Apartment Guys with Tate Seamer. Tate and friends are grateful to have you as a loyal listener. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe, rate, review, and share with friends on your Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, or any other podcast platform. Also, check out Tate's YouTube channel for videos of many of these episodes and more. Until next time, take massive action steps and rock on.